Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland. This is relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety and panic attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And that doesn't mean that you need to close your eyes. But, you know, it's good to have that as a, as an option, you know. Um, it's partly because I'm the, the biggest closey eyes person there is. You know, I can listen to heavy metal music and fall asleep. You know, it's just the way I am. Could even be relaxing. Now, I know people who can relax. The thing that they do most to relax is to dance. I've got a friend who has Tourette's and the thing that relaxes him most and actually reduces his tics and everything like that is by dancing. Or if he's performing on stage, acting, because he's an actor and a comedian. So when he's performing, he doesn't have the tics. So, or when he dances as well. Dancing relaxes him. And for me, that would be the complete opposite. The idea of wobbling around the floor like I would if I was dancing. I imagine it feel quite nice, to be fair. Sometimes I do have a little dance when there's no one around. There's a, you know, a song on and I'll have a little, a little boogie. But... That's not really what this recording's about. So this is gonna be one of those recordings where I'm just gonna to talk to you. And I invite you to, to relax. Now, if you listen to me regularly, just by listening to me, just by hearing my voice, by pressing the play button, on this recording can be enough for you to get in touch with that familiar feeling of letting go. You know, the muscles in your body relax, your mind calms down, maybe slows down, maybe some of the thoughts in your mind seem to just almost dissolve. Like I was trying to think of something that dissolves. I suppose, like a, an aspirin or a sherbet in water or those, you know those little tablets that give you vitamin C, put them in a, in a water and it gives you almost like a glass of orange juice. Something like that seems to that kind of dissolve in but at the same time transforming into something more positive and useful, which is almost what I attempt with my words when I'm talking about some things. Now, In this recording, I'm going to talk about support networks or the feeling of a lack of being supported, the you know, the in whether day-to-day -day life or through stressful times. Now, I'm going to guess that probably a good high percentage of people listening to this maybe at times don't feel 
that uh, you're getting the support that you need. And there's a few things that this raises, a few ideas and thoughts that kind of come up with this question of support. And I think, I'm just going to undo my jacket. Oh. My nipples need a bit of breeze, that's better. I think it's sometimes maybe we need, there's times, I know from my own personal experience, there's times I've needed support and not asked for it. There's times when I've needed support and asked for it and not got it. There's other times when I've needed support, asked for it, and have got it. And other times when I need support and didn't ask for it, and still got it. So, you know, I've also been on the receiving end of other people needing my support, and not always being able to give them what they needed. So, there's so many different angles to approach this subject with because I know that I have friends that perhaps have mental health issues and it can be it can be useful sometimes to have friends like that in a sense of being able to relate maybe to some of the experiences that they're having whether it's with social care or lack of or you know some of the life experiences and stuff but some of the problems that I've found is sometimes I need support from them and they can't give it because they've got their own stuff going on or vice versa then I've noticed in the past I think of a particular person I'm not going to say their name who became a support for me But it wasn't really what they, they didn't volunteer the job, you know. I just, they were a really good listener. They actually went on to become a counsellor. Uh, partly, I think, because I kept telling them that they'd be a brilliant counsellor. But this person would listen to me. And it was a great listener and had great advice at times. And, you know, I really kind of looked up to, looked up to him. But it wasn't until years later that I realised that I never asked his permission to offload onto him. You know, with me out for lunch, he probably had a, a busy day with, you know, doing what he was doing, and then I'd just expect him to ask me how I am, which he would, and then for me to telling my my problems especially during my the ex you know the really um the bad times i had with anxiety and stress but for me never to well i, I think quite often not to ask him how he was Sometimes I'd even make a joke of it, you know, just as we were about to leave the the cafe or restaurant or whatever you want to call it, you know, where we'd had some lunch. I'd say, so how are you then? And he'd start talking. I said, right now, back to me. And even though I kind of turned it into a joke, the reality is I didn't ask him permission. And... I think it was probably, a, well, I'd say, yeah, 
it was a bit unfair of me, in a way. But in my defence, I was... He was kind of my only support. So I guess I grabbed hold of him. I, you know, I didn't want to let him go because he seemed to be the only person that uh, had... He well, seemed to be the only person that really cared or seemed to care. But I did take advantage. I didn't mean to, but I did. And it was, it was very one-sided. Very one-sided. I tried to make up for it in subsequent years and tried to be a friend to him and listen to what he's got to say as well. Um, but... The whole dynamic of having a support group can be, I think, quite complicated. And then there's different types of support, isn't there? There's, there's the emotional support, but then there's financial support, there's uh, practical support, maybe. So we're in the, the process of another lockdown in my country for a month. And there's practical support that I could personally, and I guess I, well, I would say thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people could benefit by some practical help with, uh, you know, getting food, things like that, that isn't available to people with mental health issues because as like the rest of the year when we're not in lockdown people with physical issues physical uh, disabilities for example are always placed first above people with mental health issues that's the way it's always been, and maybe that's the way it will always be. I don't know. There's definitely a priority towards uh, people with physical issues. Um, I can understand why, in a sense of, you can see somebody with a physical issue, you can see someone that it needs help, whether it's um, physically, you know, unable to walk or uh, having trouble with that stuff or whatever else it might be. And mental health issues aren't always as obvious unless there's severe behaviour. So if someone's in the middle of the town centre screaming and shouting and having a tantrum uh, but not making any sense uh, and really, you know, causing a scene, then the average person would walk past and say, oh, they're mental, they're crazy. And the person would very much likely either get arrested or sectioned. Or if they keep doing it, they probably get ignored. Which is kind of weird. I'm actually, I know, going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I've been in town and I've seen people who have been abusive to the police. Uh, swearing at the police and telling them to the F off, get away from me, don't come near. When the police haven't done anything, they're just, they're just walking up the same part of the street and the police do nothing. I know if I did that, I would get arrested. So, It's, I don't know what more, it's, there's no point to that, what, what I'm saying is just something I've noticed. 
which means that I guess there are those who are in need of help that may not get it because they're classed as just a trouble or a societal problem that needs to be ignored. Ignore it and it'll go away kind of attitude. But back to support. It's a weird, it's a weird one because if you get, if you get professional support, you know, I, for example, from the, the health service, whether it's a counsellor, therapist, nurse, doctor, social worker, they're professional people and they don't need nor require or expect anything back in return. So a psychotherapist will listen to you or whoever's you know there for 50 minutes. They don't expect um, for you to then listen to them talking for 50 minutes and to unburden themselves onto you because they're professionals and they're getting paid and although a lot of people that do work in that environment are not getting paid. Huge, thousands if not millions of people volunteering in the health service, in different charities and, you know, so they're, they're not getting anything financial gain from helping others. But they also don't expect to reciprocate the whole, you know, sharing and the, the caring and all that stuff. But unless you've got the money, especially if you're, you may be in a country where this stuff is expensive, or the opposite would be in England, where it's generally free with a huge waiting list. And depending, depending on where you live, would depend on how long you have to wait. So if you're in a big city, you might be waiting for a long time in order to get the support that you need. So then we perhaps go look into family and friends for support. But they're not qualified. Not really. You could say, well, who could be more qualified than someone that knows me? Knowing someone doesn't make them qualified to be an emotional support. Sometimes it can be the complete opposite. Depends what kind of relationship, I guess, you have with that person. Because one of the main benefits of seeing a counsellor or therapist is they don't know you. And whatever you say to them during your sessions with them, whatever you talk to them about, whatever personal information you share, at no point in the future will that be brought up in an argument or as evidence to, you know, for someone to win an argument. Now, using support, using a family member or a friend for support, that can very easily happen where the person brings up, what about when you had that breakdown? What about when you said you were never gonna take drugs again? What about this, what about that? And they don't realize when they say it, and they're saying it to hurt you, of course, but they don't realize perhaps how much they're hurting emotionally when they say that stuff. And maybe they're saying it just to prove a point, and perhaps even thinking that they're being useful. I remember I helped this friend of mine, she was 19, 
and she took an overdose and she posted it on Facebook and I saw it and I called her up, I phoned her up, got a taxi. She posted something, I don't know she was sitting like, I took an overdose, but she posted something that was very alarming. So I phoned her up. She'd taken an overdose. She'd gone to hospital and then she just released herself from hospital because she didn't want to wait. And then she felt ill. She was at home feeling ill. So I got a taxi to her house, took her to the hospital and made sure she got tested. You know, made sure that she was, um, I don't know, made sure she was okay that they tested her, which they did. And they did say that she was close to having caused proper damage to her kidneys or something. And, you know, to never do it again, which is good advice. And her mum came in and, you know, I'm pretty sure that no one in the world loves loves her more than her mum and her dad. I know that she's, they, you know, they're quite close, quite close family as far as I know. So I know that her mum was talking through love. But the stuff her mum was saying to her was the opposite of what was needed in that time. She started focusing and saying, oh, you know, go to university. You won't be able to go to university if they hear about this. And it's like, it was like she was having a go at her for having tried to kill herself, which is the opposite to what is needed. I understand why she would, because how, you know, having your daughter do something like that there are no it's not a rule book you can't just how do you just you know, go by the rules well okay I should be calm now and but the reality is it wasn't useful and it seemed to be making things worse so in the end I separated them and said you know, and I had a little chat with my mum and said, look, it's not all the time. Try and just be there for her, but try not to be having a go at her and moaning at her. Which is hard. It's just, it was just a, almost an impossible situation because I had no control over what happened after they left. I'm pretty sure that she would have just carried on having a go at her. But I hope not. And that was an example of people that loved each other dearly. Trying to be supportive. But at the same time being caught up in their own emotions which doesn't happen in a therapeutic situation like counselling because a therapist doesn't bring their own emotion stuff into the room. Doesn't mean that the therapist isn't affected by what they hear because they're human beings. But they're not gonna then go on a rant 10 minutes about their own experience and their own life and start telling off the patient or client because that would be very weird and unprofessional so I guess one of the things you know I'm not I'm not getting any kickbacks from therapists I'm not making money out of I've not got a whole load of therapists paying me money to say this stuff but if you can, if you can, and find out if you can, if you need emotional support, try and see a professional. Seek out a professional. If you're in America or 
a country which deals very much with insurance, medical insurance, find out what is available on your medical plan, on your medical insurance. I don't 100% understand the way things are done in America, but I've got kind of an idea. And things are different in different parts of the country, I guess, as well, in America, and things are different in this country. And they'll be different in Canada, Australia, and New, New Zealand, South Africa, Spain, you know, it's going to be different everywhere, I guess. And as some people will say, oh, I can't afford to see a therapist, that's £50 an hour, or $50 an hour, or $60 an hour, I can't afford that. Okay, and what amazes me, and it amazed me, I mean I've actually had clients in the past that had, they were trying to get, you know, I knew from what, I knew from what they said that they had a considerable, considerable amount of money in the bank, like through maybe inheritance or just because they used to have a really good job or whatever, yet they were still trying to get the money down per hour. Still trying to sort of say, well, can you do it for 20 pound an hour? Which I would say could possibly show a sign of not really valuing, not valuing the service as much as perhaps they could or they just might naturally have that tightness, you know, that uh, making everything as cheap as possible, which might be why they've got money in the bank, because they don't spend anything. Who knows, I'm not here to judge that, but, but I am, I'm judging it, I am, obviously. But I'm not, I don't really understand that mentality outside of if you haven't actually got the money. But if there's going to be, you say, well, it's going to be £30 an hour or £50 an hour, and I suggest you come for six weeks. Don't have to, but that's why I suggest um, to start with. And once the six weeks is over, you know, we can review it on week four, and then if you want to continue after the six weeks, we can do that or we can bring it to a close on the sixth week. 50 pound an hour. That's 350 pound for six sessions. Okay, 350 pound paid out in, in one go is more than I would be able to afford, but most therapists don't charge ahead of time, I don't think. So 50 pound, especially, if you can, I, I've seen clients, I've worked in, with charities as a counsellor in the past, I've seen people that were suicidal and after week three were no longer suicidal. Now they didn't pay for that, they didn't pay for the service, it's a charity. But if they had paid for it and it had cost, at the time I think I used to charge £30 an hour, so it's £90 to go from being wanting to kill themselves to no longer wanting to kill themselves for £90. If you look at it in uh, financial terms, which is not how I would normally look at it. So I think it's, it's worth maybe if the financial side of things is getting in the way, you know, if it's a case of, well, I don't want to spend that money, I want it for free, which a lot of people do. I do, I like things for free, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend I don't, of course I do. It's part of the reason why I like providing a free service because it's nice to have free stuff, you know, it's good. But at the same time, therapists, just like any other profession, 
have to pay a lot of money to get those qualifications. I spent three years in university. Uh, so I got into debt by nearly 30 grand. And it's about value, not just the value, but not paying for something doesn't mean that someone doesn't value it. But if the only way to get something is by paying for it, and you don't pay for it, even if you can, then it means probably you don't value it. So from a support perspective, it might seem like I'm just trying to promote therapy. And in a way, maybe I am. Because it can be, it can be one of the most amazing things you'll ever experience. It might be the first time ever that you sat in a room and somebody's actually listened to you. Without interrupting you. Without telling you what to do or maybe what to think. And you know that that person is not going to be gossiping about what you've spoken about. They're not going to be talking about you to their friends or to your friends or to your family because it stays in the room. And there's a value to that, which is much more than the hourly rate that you may pay. I've said stuff in therapy that I would not say to anybody else. There's one particular thing, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it here either, but I told my therapist, when I was having psychotherapy, and I told him, and I've never told a living person or a dead person in my life. And it wasn't anything really horrible, by the way. I hadn't committed some terrible crime, nothing like that. But it was something that was very personal that I didn't ever share with anyone else. And it felt quite nice to have sort of said it out loud. Even though it's not something I'm particularly ashamed of. I am a little bit, perhaps, but... Yeah, so there's something to be said for that. Now, if you've got a friend who is very close to you, that also wouldn't share what you say to them. Um, someone that would not bring up in a future argument something that you've told them when you were vulnerable. Then that's brilliant if you've got someone like that. I personally don't have anyone like that. Well, Actually, that's not totally true. I probably... Uh, maybe I do. But I guess for me, and I did a recording a while back, saying the benefit of doing, you know, like uh, a vlog, a blog, a journal, making a video, making an audio recording of yourself where you talk about how you're feeling. And there's a lot of benefit for that for you if you was to give it a go. Especially, I mean, you can, of course, share that stuff online, on YouTube, in podcasts, in book format, you know, if you wanted to do that in a blog or whatever, on a website. But you could also just do it for your own personal reasons so that you can actually release those feelings. 
express yourself but without without any comeback, without any without needing to make excuses or without needing to explain yourself. And sometimes saying things out, out loud or writing something down in itself can be really therapeutic and is a big part of your support network if you allow it to be. It could be the main part of your support network if you live a solitary life. Like I, I live a very solitary life at the moment. I don't think it's always going to be like this. You know, there will be changes in the future. But at the moment, you know, I'm pretty much... Uh, it's me and Andre the Ferret who lives with me. And, you know... By doing the Let Me Boy to Sleep recordings, I talk about my life. And I do that on a daily basis. And I think that helps me in a way of releasing and just talking about stuff, even though it may not be particularly important or interesting. And with practically no feedback even though it's published on the internet and listened by, you know, a few people around the world. So the support network doesn't necessarily have to be this big group of people. And I used to think that, because if I think of the word network, I think of almost like a hierarchy system like a building almost, you know, sort of lots of different parts connected. Um, I suppose like a circuit, some kind of electrical circuit and the networks there or in IT terms, networking uh, or even in like social terms, networking is where you're contacting lots of other people who are then, con you know, you meet one person, then you meet their friends, and then you meet their friends, and you make contacts that may may improve your life chances, business and social. Now, I'm not a networker, <laughs> to be honest with you. I've, um, no, I never have been, but then I've never needed to be, really. So when I think about having a network, a support network, I used to think of it as being this big thing, this big, you know, containing lots of different people. Some you could call on, some perhaps you could only call on in, you know, specific situations. I've always prefer, preferred to have individual friends that didn't know each other. That's just my... I found over time that that is... It's... Well, for me, it's better because, you know, there's, there's no gossip. As far as I'm concerned, the only person that should know something that I've said is the person that's heard it. So if I tell... Bob, that I've got an exercise bike. I don't expect Tony to come up to me in the street and said, how's your exercise bike? Tony should know about it. If I've told Bob, and if he's the only person I've told, he's the only person I should know. But he's gone and told his wife, maybe, and his wife is best friends with Tony's sister and why everyone's so interested in my exercise bike I don't know but that stuff 
I'm not really a big fan of. It's just a personal thing. Some people may class that as a support network. People that know each other. And if they're looking out for you, then that really can be great. So it's about what do you want as a support network? And ultimately, I think we need to be our own support. We need to be the boss. We need to remember that we are the boss. And I think if you need help, ask for it. It's the number one rule that I would kind of present. If you really, really need help, ask for it. If you need an ambulance, you phone for an ambulance. You know, you don't phone the pizza parlor, you don't phone up the chemist, pharmacy, you phone for an ambulance. That's the thing. And some people won't phone for an ambulance. They'll phone up their daughter, they'll phone up their parents. Which, for me, why didn't you... Okay, phone an ambulance first, then maybe phone up a family member and let them know what's going on. But I can, I can kind of see part of the reason why they may phone a family member first if they fear losing consciousness or you know, something like that, but call an ambulance if that's what's needed so if you need emotional support such as counselling, therapy or if someone was suicidal phone a helpline that is there specifically for helping people that are going through emotional trauma or feeling lonely or whatever the situation may be there are phone lines in, in England they're called the Samaritans as well as our other phone lines as well specifically for people with like bipolar or uh, eating disorders and you know things like that the child line for children that are experiencing um difficult times with adults I'm being very vague with those words but you know it's, it's there for uh, all kinds of uh, situations in order to protect children now asking for help is something that I I don't think it should be the last resort. If I go further, it should never be the last resort. Ask for help when you need help. And some people have pride issues where they feel, well, I'm not going to ask for help because for a variety of things maybe they don't feel that they deserve the help or they feel that other people deserve the help more and they don't want to take away the time or the service from the other person you know they may not phone up a helpline number thinking well if I'm on the phone someone else that needs it more than me won't be able to get through which is probably unlikely because a lot of those telephone numbers or emails are 24 hours with thousands and thousands of people you know online and on the telephones so you might be put in a queue but that's probably the the worst case scenario hopefully so how can you be your own support and I what I had this, what was it? I remember I had a, a client that had epilepsy. 
And the thing I said to her was, before we go any further, I'm just going to readjust my bomb. I didn't say that to her. I'm just saying now, because I've got lower back issues and it just gets a little bit... Uh, Oh, I have to stretch it every now and then. So I didn't say what I said to her was, I didn't yawn either. I said to her, before we go any further, can I just sort this out? So you put on your form, because we had to fill a form in any medical conditions, um, you know, what medication you want, stuff like that. And she'd told me that she was she had epilepsy and I said to her well look what's the situation with that so if you was to go if you was to have a, an epileptic seizure what do I need to do and she went through it she told me what I needed to do and I was then prepared I didn't really give it any more thought after that and it never happened during our time together. But I think of that as being almost like a strategy, a support strategy for uh, in, in the event of an emergency. And to me, for someone that has uh, depression, anxiety, stress, panic attacks. An emergency is an extreme situation which would you know, lead to perhaps a panic attack or such extreme stress or anxiety as to be almost unable to function. Now that is an emergency situation just as somebody who is asthmatic, an emergency would be having an asthma attack. And they're prepared, not all of them obviously, because not everybody carries their inhaler around with them, but they should, and I would. If I was, if I was asthmatic, I would have an inhaler with me all the time, because I'm a believer in being prepared for those kinds of situations. You know, not leaving it to chance. You know, it's, I don't run out of sugar. I don't run out of toilet paper. Generally, I've always got a bit of spare. Always, you know, always got a little, little bit of stock because I think being prepared is useful. Which is why I have the locksmith telephone number on, on my phone. I'm not expecting to need a locksmith, but I needed it once. And if I ever need him again, I've got the number. Which means I don't have to try and figure a way of getting the number because you know if I'm outside my flat I don't have access to any internet maybe I've got no data left on my phone I won't be able to get a telephone number for a locksmith without knocking on neighbours doors so having that bit of preparation for your own support I think can not only reduce anxiety and stress anyway, day to day, with a little bit of, a little bit of planning, a little bit of preparation, without having to think about it. it can take the edge off, it can really make things a little bit more easier to deal with. So to have an emergency number, to have someone that you can call in the event of needing to get somewhere. So 
uh, whether it's a friend with a car or a telephone number for a taxi service. Having that stuff available beforehand means you haven't got to think about it. It's one of those things that is just no longer required thinking. It's not needed. You don't need to think about stuff like that if you're already kind of organised. And with the support network, you can almost plan beforehand in the event of needing help preparing yourself to know that it's okay to ask for help when you need it. And sometimes this in itself can help you to relax because part of the, I guess part of the problem of anxiety and anxiety attacks is not being able to function part the the unknown the not knowing whether or not you're going to be able to cope with it and what to do so if you've already got a plan in place even if it's just a general plan in your mind you've got the telephone numbers in your phone you know who you call if you need to call somebody and it's sorted and then you don't have to think about it again. Which brings us to the person that you can rely on as your support. And maybe sometimes we perhaps can put, like I used to put pressure on my friend. Maybe we expect more from other people than is useful to them or to us or is appropriate maybe because of course everybody has their own stuff going on there's always a chance that you know, if, if you go to someone and want them to support you, they might not be able to. So it's, it's useful if you've got more than one person. But ideally, a professional, if you can find one, to be there. Which is why I tell people, I used to tell people, if, if they had feelings that they wanted to hurt themselves. If they had that feeling, you know, an extreme feeling and they needed to talk to somebody but they didn't have anybody, then go to the hospital. Go to the accident emergency department and tell them. They have to listen. They have to, uh, you have to be seen by somebody. So, you know, it, it might be a last resort, but it's, it can be part of your support network. Maybe as a last resort, but quite often in an extreme situation, last resort situations and options are the correct ones because it's not a normal situation, perhaps. There's also the, the aspect of moving forward. Realising that Everything's going to change, of course. But deciding that you're going to make those changes happen. You're going to do something about it. 
So for those that are having problems with stress and anxiety, it's by listening to recordings, relaxation sessions by people like me maybe online or going to a therapist in person learning to relax, learning to meditate. So you can go one way or the other. You can actually make the effort knowing that there is no instant solution. There's an instant feeling. You can instantly feel relaxed and calm. You can instantly feel grateful for what you do have instead of focusing on all the things that you wish you had. You can instantly feel like a survivor rather than a victim. A survivor, not a victim. You can instantly have these feelings. But in order to expand that feeling into a regular, general feeling of well-being, which can transform your stress levels and transform the way that you perceive yourself and how you look towards the future in a much more brighter, positive, optimistic and healing way. Healing, positivity. And the opposite to that would be to for example, go onto Facebook and go onto a, let's say a Facebook page for a condition that maybe you have and really, really get involved in that illness. Really, you know, almost like it's all you are. Now, just the idea of that makes me feel a bit physically ill. The idea of really, I mean, there's a big difference between self-acceptance, accepting who you are, accepting how you are, to just giving in, giving up, surrendering. Big difference. You can start off accepting how you feel and where you are in order to move forward and make changes. Sometimes the acceptance is, it's almost like it's a moving ball and the acceptance is just stopping the ball from moving in a certain direction. Maybe a chaotic direction, moving, banging off different walls and different things and you catch the ball, you stop the ball's movement, which is almost saying, I accept how you are, this is fine. And then proceeding and throwing the ball in a new direction. Which causes changes to you physically and emotionally. As you realize that Actually, you 
you're going to be okay. That you're no longer a victim of anything. And you are more, so much more than a survivor. You are a winner. And even though we can't change the past, we do create our future. And every day is a new opportunity to do something different, to move forward. And that support network that maybe you need can be chosen in a more sober frame of mind, a calmer frame of mind, where you choose not based upon emotions or upon guilt or what you think you should do or say, but more on what is it that you need for yourself. And how can you get that thing that you need for yourself? And feel good about yourself in the process, positive. Knowing, really knowing that things are going to be different as you move forward. Something has changed. Something feels lighter like your heart, your mind, your brain, your body even. There's a lightness that is there now that wasn't there before. Maybe almost a brightness that fills you as you know you really know the things are now coming together Things are now really starting to change. And there's that feeling, that feeling sort of fills you up. It's so calming, so loose, relaxing and Very, very relaxed. You can feel, and you might not be able to put your finger on it, but you can feel that something's changed. You can feel it. Really feel it. So that brings us to the end of this recording. Thank you for listening. Remember to yourself because you deserve 
to be happy. Lots of love.